Coming up on Tech News Today, why Matrick is like Sanofsky, why Foursquare needs a music service, and Bing does image service better than Google? All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, July 2nd, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by ProXPN. ProXPN is a virtual private network that allows you to use the internet the way it should be, anonymously and without oversight. For 20% off your new account, go to ProXPN.com slash twit and use the code TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zachter. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we keep you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world. Put them in context for you, starting with the top 10 stories of the day in the news feeds. As all things de-speculated yesterday, Xbox division chief Don Matrick has left Microsoft to become CEO of Zynga beginning July 8th. Zynga founder and current CEO Mark Pincus will continue as chairman and chief product officer at Zynga. Matrick's direct reports will now report straight to Microsoft CEO Steve Ballmer for the time being. Ballmer is rumored to be planning a major reorg for Microsoft. Yesterday, we told you about Apple filing a trademark for the name iWatch in Japan. Turns out... It's more of a global affair because Apple's looking to trademark iWatch in Mexico, in Taiwan, in Turkey, in Colombia, in Chile, and in Russia. Best Buy will be the first brick and mortar store to sell the Pebble smartwatch. The order page for the Pebble is now live at bestbuy.com, but you can't order it yet. Best Buy has a coming soon button where you'd normally see the add to cart button. It'll cost $150 and be available in red or black starting July 7th. Motorola posted, intentionally or not, a placeholder page for a phone called the Droid Ultra, billed as thin and, quote, tough as steel, available in, quote, bunch of colors. Probably temporary text. Droid Life noticed that the <laughs> specs are actually the same as the Razer M, which probably means the page is not finished and filled with placeholder specs. The Opera software browser, Opera 15, is now available for Windows and OS X users, as well as Android users who had it already. Some notable features are speed dial for frequently used web pages, off-road mode for slower networks, the stash feature collects screenshots of web pages and puts them all in one place, and Opera Discover presents a group of web pages based on a user's interests, like regional news or music or sporting events. Canon introduced the new EOS 70D DSLR, which, is, which uses a 20.2 megapixel APS-C sensor and comes with Canon's new dual-pixel CMOS autofocus. Now, Canon says that this allows EOS 70D to have a shorter focus time and that this DSLR will record video with quality close to that of a camcorder. The 70D will be released in September. The body alone will cost you about $1,200. Kit options will cost $1,350 to $1,550. Like most of us, you're probably dreading that long commute from the city up to the Hamptons this July 4th weekend. Well, calm your mini French bulldog. We have a solution. From 12 until 8 p.m. Wednesday, Uber will let you book a $3,000 helicopter ride from your smartphone. An SUV will pick you up from anywhere in the city and take you to the helipad. You can also book an Uber X vehicle for $300 to $500 to drive you to the Hamptons if you're afraid of heights or you're like poor or something. Wait, 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 wait. There's something called a mini French bulldog? Mm-hmm. Oh, my goodness. Asus <laughs> unveiled its 31.5-inch 4K monitor last month. Now the PQ321 just rolls right off the tongue is available for pre-order on Amazon New Egg and Tiger Direct. It's an ultra HD display which is a 3840 by 2160 pixel 10 bit RGB monitor. Basically that means a billion colors. It can claim that it's the thinnest 4K monitor on the market at only 35 millimeters. Since you all want one, let's talk about the introductory price. It's a low, low $3,499.99, which is $300 less than its initial price point, but still 
really, really expensive. It's $500 more than a helicopter ride to the Hamptons. Uh, since 1998, Microsoft's TechNet program provided subscribers licenses to all Microsoft software for evaluation purposes and has been used as kind of an insider secret to cheap software ever since. That's all ending, folks. New subscriptions and renewals will not be taken after August 31st and must be activated by September 30th. Subscriptions last one year, meaning all of them will end on September 30th, 2014. Microsoft says they have shifted evaluation services is two free limited time copies. There's some new glassware for you, Google Glass, so Jason, listen up. <gasps> Sahas Kata produced an app called Glass Tesla that pairs glass to the Tesla Model S car. The app was created over a weekend, and Kata implies he reverse engineered the Tesla Android app to make his glassware. Glass Tesla lets you do all kinds of things like lock your doors, honk your horn, flash your lights, or adjust your sunroof. So enjoy the app, all three of you who own both Glass <laughs> and a Model S. I, as you're totally right, I have a Tesla. This is perfect for me. Perfect. Yes. Can you give me a ride to the Hamptons in your test? <laughs> this episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Pro XPN. Uh, as it's in the headlines pretty much every day, more than ever, your online freedom and privacy are under threat. Governments looking at your data, ISPs looking at your data, prying in there, trying to snip your packets. Uh, and, and plus, if you're traveling, I'm, I'm going on a trip soon. I'm going to be using that Wi-Fi in the airport. I want to use that Wi-Fi in the hotel. Well, that stuff is dangerous. People can 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 sniff out your passwords, get your sensitive data. It can all be intercepted. That's why I'm using Pro XPN. It's a virtual private network that works with almost any internet connection. Creates a secure encrypted tunnel through all, which all of your data passes. That way, nobody can see it. Uh, and any online application can work with ProXPN because it's just an internet connection. Uh, you can use a web browser, you can use email, you can do, share, share your files, do your instant messaging, all the stuff you normally do. Keep everything you do hidden from prying eyes. Disguise your physical location and still get unfettered access to any website or online service no matter where you live. Uh, it can protect yourself from filtered or blocked websites, works via OpenVPN or PPTP. You're, you get to choose. That gives you lots of flexibility and complete online privacy, as I mentioned, through a 512-bit encryption tunnel, world-class customer support. And the thing that convinced me to give it a whirl was Steve Gibson giving it a great review on security now. So go try it out. Go to proxpn.com slash twit for more information. You can sign up there. ProXPN premium accounts are normal. Normally $9.95 a month or $74.95 a year, but we've got a special offer. You don't have to pay that much. Use the code TNT and you get 20% off for the lifetime of your account. That's less than five bucks a month on the yearly plan. If you're not satisfied, you can cancel within seven days for a full refund. So go go there, proxpn.com slash twit. Keep yourself safe. Sign up with the code TNT. We thank ProXPN for their support of Tech News Today. I'll be using it next week when I'm on vacation. All right, we were going to have Danny Sullivan of Search Engine Land on the show today. A little miscommunication prevented him from getting on. We hope to rebook him and have him back on the show soon. But let's get right into the tech news and uh, talk about the thing we were speculating on with Dills yesterday. Uh, Zynga definitely did hire Don Matrick as their CEO, Sarah. Yeah, it was kind of like right after the show, it all became official. So we spent all this time talking about, well, what do we think? Does this make sense? And indeed, it's a real deal. Uh, Steve Ballmer uh, sent a note to... Uh, it, uh, the members of, of Matrix team over at Microsoft uh, saying, quote, since joining IEB more than six years ago, Don and his team have accomplished much. Xbox Live members grew from 6 million to 48 million. Xbox 360 became the number one selling console in North America the past two years. We introduced Connect and have sold more than 24 million sensors. All of that is very impressive. If you read the sort of goodbye to to Don Matrick, it if you want to parse it, I mean, it's either just very uh, by the book, let's not get emotional here, or there's no love lost between the two men. Uh, on the Zynga side of it, Mark Pincus, uh, who has announced that he's stepping down as CEO but will continue to head up product, uh, said in a note to all employees at Zynga, I realize I've had the greatest impact working as an entrepreneur with product teams, developing games that could entertain and connect millions. I've always said to our board, if I could find somebody who could do a better job as our CEO, I'd do all I could to recruit and bring that person in. I am confident that Don is that leader. Wall Street Journal is reporting that Matrick is apparently going to be paid about in 95% of his salary will be compensation in stock which might sound odd, although Mark Pincus uh, 
over the last year basically took no salary at all because Zynga yeah, was... Steve Jobs famously took like um, like a dollar in salary or something. So that, that's more common than you may think. Yeah. I think really at this point, you know, we did a lot of speculation on what it all means and is this, you know, is this uh, Microsoft trying to get rid of a bad Apple, you know, on the Xbox team because they've had some bad press lately? Is this more of a, a guy who's going to save Zynga? I think the most interesting thing here is kind of the timing of it all. It, Matrick headed up what is, you know, it, it, a very successful Xbox brand, but he's not staying for the Xbox One launch later this year. What do you guys think? I mean, is this like Microsoft needing to get rid of him or is it more of a Zynga said, well, we need you now? I think it's a you can't fire me, I quit situation, frankly. I mean, I, I, I look at what happened with Steve Sadowski after the launch of Windows 8. There was almost no time lost. And he was like, see ya. And we had the same conversation. Did he get pushed out or did he leave on his own? And I think in both cases, it's a little of both. I think Matrick was probably looking at the writing on the wall and saying, I'm not in Steve Ballmer's plans. And Ballmer probably didn't give him any illusions that he was. Said, look, you know what? You want to take that CEO job at Zynga? You go take it. Going to go to EA, take that job? Sure. Get out of here. So mm -hmm. I, I feel like this is part of the Ballmer plan, but maybe not getting pushed out so much as Matrick just kind of re realizing it. I think this is a crazy move for Matrick. I think it'd be better to be on Steve Ballmer's bad list or to be like demoted by Steve Ballmer at Microsoft than to go to Zynga, where 95% of your salary is tied to that stock. I know it went. I know the stock went up on news or the rumors of Matrick moving over to Zynga, but Zynga's a mess. I don't know if Matrick's enough to take care of this company and to make it worthwhile. He could have had a really cushy position at Microsoft, so I'm assuming he just wants to become the biggest deal in the world by saving Zynga, kind of like Marissa Meyer's trying to do with Yahoo. I don't know professionally what a good move that is at all for someone like Matrick. Well, I don't know. If you're looking at being fired and, and someone offers you a CEO position, which looks better on your resume? Well, you're assuming he's going to be fired as, as opposed to being demoted or being a part of a different well, decision, okay. right? Well, okay, let's even let's lessen it to say, okay, you're going to be demoted or you can have CEO on your resume of, 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 a, <laughs> of a major Wall Street traded company. Be demoted to a company that is stable versus Zynga. Uh, I don't know if you want to be and, the head of a sinking if ship. If you're a CEO, if you're a CEO, you always have a golden parachute. Well, you doesn't matter if you're paid 95% in stock and the stock goes down. You always do well when you exit as a CEO. So here's you're going to get a chief executive title, which will help you get another CEO job in the future, and you're going to be a board member of Zynga, which is which is a big step up, and you're going to get all of this money no matter what happens because that's the way it works in the business world today. I, I see no downside. For Matrick in this situation, especially since everyone in the Xbox world hates him right now. Well, that's just the, the, the popular uh, opinion, right? They hate Matrick because they, his name is popping up for that quote. But people are going to forget about that. It'll be fine. Yeah, I feel like this is. I, I mean, the whole Matrick is 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 bad for for the for the Xbox brand. I think is totally out of proportion. I mean, it's it's very timely right now, just because because of um, because of E3, but. I wish him well at Zynga, I guess. I, the whole thing seems to me, Mark Pink is being like, well, I can't run this place into the ground any more than I already have. Let's let's try something else. Uh, you know, I've already made quite a bit of money. So give him a bunch of stock, see where it goes. Stock is up a little bit, 10%, although it's still really, really down since their IPO back in 2011. All right, let's uh, talk a little bit about Bing search. I really wanted to talk to Danny about this one. Uh, Bing has added Creative Commons filtering to the search engine, uh, and it's now part of Office 2013. When you search for Bing images from Office apps, it will allow you to filter by any kind of image or public domain, free to share and use, free to share and use commercially, free to modify, share and use, or free to modify, share and use commercially. Now, Google does the same thing, but it does not include public domain separately, and it hides the option in advanced searches. Uh, so if you if you look here at at Bing, you've got this little license drop down menu right here in the Bing image menu system, and there you go. You can say, okay, I want to fr I want something to free to share and use commercially. There's all the giraffe images I could use, and I can use them with the Creative Commons license attached. That's great. If you go to Google. And you want the same thing. They have a, a search tools drop down menu, but it doesn't have the ability to search by the licenses. You have to go into the advanced search and scroll way down to the usage rights. And then you can say free to share or use commercially. And you have to pick advanced search and you get the same thing. So Bing made it a little easier. But the other thing to remember is that when you're in Bing 
and you search for something and it looks at the license, I'm going to search for Doctor Who. Now, all of these are free to share and use commercially. Really? The BBC made those? I don't I, I don't know, but let's go let's go with the uh, Hawaii 50. These are free to share and use commercially. CBS has made all of these Creative Commons. Like, I just don't believe that the proper license is attached in all of these cases. So it's a bit of a caveat. What do you, what do you guys think about people relying on this and, and being kind of touting like, hey, we've got an easier way for you to find images you can use safely? We were actually talking about issues like this on uh, This Week in Law last week about people taking images that are have copyrights on them and then they relicense them under Creative Commons or public domain, which messes up things like Bing or Google. So it does seem like it's a little bit dangerous. But then again, I guess it's, I'm kind of curious if Microsoft's going to go out of their way to try to find and match these images with copyrighted works to make sure that they are not showing up in their results. I'm not sure what Google does, actually, to make sure that they are not victim of that as well because... I'm sure there's some kind of thing in the disclaimer, somewhere in the terms of service, our results are not necessarily something you should rely on so Microsoft can say, oh, it's not our problem that you, you used a copyrighted image. But I'm curious if, if this move is very consumer friendly, though. It's like, oh, look, I can find this right up front. It's not an advanced feature to find something like this. Yeah, I, I can definitely see bi uh, the Bing folks, if for whatever reason something gets through the filter, and you use it because you're like, I can use it. And then somebody makes you take it down off of your site or sues you or whatever. There being some sort of a terms of service saying, you know, we're, we're not, we're sort of guiding you towards images that you can use freely. But yeah, like you said, Tom, there's something fishy about all of that. I mean, can I really use all those images? That doesn't seem right. I like the idea of making it easier for people to use images that are meant to be shared, you know, and everybody kind of benefits from, I guess, the promotion aspect of it all. But I would I would be very wary about just pulling stuff off of some filtered search on Bing that's well-meaning. Yeah, because the liability is on you. Google and, and Bing are, are not indemnifying you. They're saying, this person says they have the license. We're not going to comment on whether they're right or not, but they say they do. And you can search to find out the person that says it. What happens after that's between you and the person you're getting the image from? So if they're lying, they can be liable. And if you use it improperly, you could be liable. Maybe you could sue them. We're safe harbor. We're out of here. Uh, so it, it is interesting to see Bing sort of touting this. And I love the idea. I, I, I would love to be able to trust that. And I think actually in the majority of cases, if you're looking for giraffe images, you probably can trust it. Uh, but I, yeah, I, I'm curious how Bing is indexing that stuff. And, and I think that's a great idea. What I have suggested is doing some kind of, of copyright match. But we know how well that works on YouTube. <laughs> Uh, so maybe that's not such a great idea. I, you know, for now, I'll just stay with my current image search at Alta Vista and, uh, and, and go with that. Oh, yeah, that'll take you far. That's I'll why I take millions of photos oh. of things I, I'll never need, like a, a real great shot of a shoelace, because I own the rights to that at least. I don't have to go <laughs> relying on these searches. Why am I taking pictures of giraffes? Because I need them eventually. <laughs> all right, Foursquare teaming up with Deezer. Deezer. First of all, Deezer is a music service that a lot of people probably aren't even aware of. Yeah, so Foursquare's got a new deal with uh, streaming service Deezer. If you check into seven different music events, you'll get three month a, a three month Deezer Premium Plus subscription. Uh, the promotion is for Foursquare users in a bunch of countries, including Brazil, Mexico, the UK, Australia, and Poland. Uh, there's going to be three different tiers for check-ins. One check-in gets you into level one. Three gets you into level two, and seven into level three. If you manage to check in seven times, you'll have to like the Deezer page on Foursquare to get the Premium Plus subscription. So we got badges, discounts, free music. Sarah, you, you're a music renter. Is this the kind of thing that uh, would get you to use something like Deezer? Um, I think that this is a great idea for, um, first of all, it's Foursquare just kind of saying like, hey, what sticks? You know, how can, how can we pivot off of the old, you know, mayorships that much more? If somebody does not already have a music subscription service online that they really like and are loyal to, I can see this being pretty cool. Um, I don't go to a lot of music events. I just happen to consume a lot of music, you know, on my headphones. So I feel like this, I, it would be hard to even get to seven different music events and then get the three months um, Deezer subscription. However, if for whatever reason you're a big music fan, you know, Foursquare knows it's like there are people who love going to music shows. So maybe these people are just really, really into live music, but then everyone can benefit from them getting hooked onto some sort of uh, music service online. 
I, I think it's I think it's a pretty great idea. I don't know if I'm the right target audience though. Well, yeah, I, I'm the same way, right? I don't go to a lot of live music. I definitely know people who do and might take advantage of this. I don't know if this would make me switch off RDO to Deezer necessarily, but think about it if they, okay, so this is a music promotion. Let's say they get one with food, uh, with one of those dine out, plans where they have the promotion sometimes where you get like discount meals at really really excellent restaurants now you're talking my language if it's like oh check in at five restaurants and then get like a, a, a booklet of 10 discount or free meals at really excellent restaurants or or maybe it's electronics purchases you, you check in you know or maybe it's coffee shops i don't know but start thinking about it as not if music isn't your thing, what if it was a uh, movie service? Let's, let's say Voodoo partners with, with theaters. You check in theaters five times and you get like a free movie on Voodoo, something like that. But wasn't that yeah. the intention behind the mayorships? There used to be these discounts for mayors. If you check in, you find out there's a special deal that you wouldn't see otherwise. Hasn't Foursquare already tried that? Yeah, but they tried. That's location based, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in other words, you have to be the mayor at that one particular place. So that benefits one person and one place. This is, we don't care. We don't have to have a deal with theaters. We just I have see. to know you're checking in with theaters. We have to have a deal with a bigger national company, and we're more likely to get them and get their money, I think. It's also, you get something out of uh, being vaguer with genres, more vague with genres. So instead of like, hey, if you check into this particular cafe, you might get 50% off of your, 15% uh, off your next latte. It's like, if you just check in at coffee shops and we're not going to tell you which ones, that's all up to you because we don't want to tell you what to do with your life. Then you get, you know, a, a, a free something free just by to playing along. Something. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I, I, I mean, Foursquare I, sometimes feels to me like, and I still use Foursquare, and I know some people are like, ah, who uses Foursquare anymore? I'm definitely one of those people. They're 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 seeing what sticks promotion wise, and that's fine. And you know, go for it, Foursquare. But I feel a little Foursquare fatigue as far as all of these specials and promotions. And there's Foursquare Explore, and there's Foursquare. You know, you you've got a setting that you can turn on so that when you walk by something, you're supposed to get a text message, sort of like a pop up notification that there's a there's a special inside, and that doesn't even really work all that often. I don't know. I I hope they I hope they figure out specifically kind of what they are as a company soon. Aren't all those features supposed to make you want to keep Foursquare running all the time and you want it in your pocket to give you a text? It seems like you're getting irritated that it has a lot <laughs> of features. It's like, oh, it's so much help. We're really helpful. Hey, it's Clippy of Foursquare. Yeah, I just, I don't know. It, it, they seem unfocused and I get that they're they're sort of trying to, to, to pave their way and figure out how to make money and how to keep all of us giving them our location data. But um, it's kind of confusing, at least right now. Well, I, I, I don't find Foursquare confusing if I don't think about it. Like when I use it, it's like, oh, they've, they've gotten really good at being like, are you here? And I'm like, yeah, I actually, I am. You're, you're getting better at this. Uh, if, if they throw up a sort of like, hey, you checked in at a bunch of music places. Want this discount subscription to Deezer? I'm not, I don't know if I'm going to mind that necessarily. Um, but I don't live in Brazil, Mexico, Indonesia, or any of the countries that get yeah, it. Yeah, it doesn't so. even apply to you, Tom. <laughs> does, Unless you doesn't move. apply to <laughs> Those of you who are always complaining we don't do stories that apply to your country, well, there you go. Deezer, take it. Let's talk about solar power now. Apple is going to be building a solar plant next to one of their data centers. Yeah, in our country, in fact. <laughs> uh, in Reno, Nevada, outside of Reno, Nevada. This is actually a really is interesting Nevada story. Is Nevada in our so, country? I guess it is. Yeah. yeah. Apple's working with uh, Nevada utility, NV Energy, to build solar panel, five, a very large solar panel solar panel farm it's covering 137 acres next to a new data center that they're building uh, in reno nevada they're calling it the fort churchill solar array and this is not new apple's been building two solar panel farms next to another data center in north carolina but this reno will uh reno one will be another build out it's interesting because it's going to provide between 18 and 20 megawatts uh, worth of power, and it's using a new type of solar technology. So both solar panels uh, and also mirrors will be used to concentrate the sun's rays, which will provide up to seven times the power uh, generated from these panels. Apple's working with a, co a solar company called SunPower on the engineering and construction for this. And there's the, the uh, Apple is working with the state of Nevada um, because Nevada has introduced new green tariffs that are approved by Nevada's Utility Commission. 
that lets Apple pay for the cost of building out the solar panel farm. So Apple's like, we've got the money, we can build this out. Then NV Energy, which is the Nevada utility, can pay Apple to use that solar farm or eventually buy that solar farm that's been built out by the company and then use it in its energy generating assets. Uh, the Utility Commission of Nevada approved this uh, tariff on June 12th. Apple has an option to expand the solar farm as well, if all goes well. Um, so, and this is all, again, part of Apple uh, very publicly stating it wants to get to 100% clean power for its data centers through a mixture of clean power, buying renewable energy credits, and then buying clean power from providers. This is pretty cool. I mean, does, does it, is there any, like, downside of the fact that Apple's like, we want to do this. This is this makes us look good and we're experimenting with new technology. And then the state of Nevada gets an energy build up that it can piggyback on later on. It definitely seems yeah. like a smart uh, business deal for Apple and, and the state of Nevada. The big thing for me is the practical concerns of data centers being built out. They're huge for Apple. The cloud services for Apple these days, iCloud messages, all that stuff. Not exactly stellar, not running very smoothly. If they can get more and more servers up, whatever it takes, if it's green powered, that's great. But get those servers running and get those services in order because Google's just killing it when it comes to cloud services and Apple's a mess. Yeah, and I don't even care if they add more servers. If that's the if that's the solution, great. But it's it's the management of the service that seems to be the issue, not not just capacity. Uh, so so sure, part of it adding more servers, I want to see that. Part of it like I has said, get the service sorted out so it actually works reliably all the time, uh, whatever the, the issue is. But all that said, I think it's pretty cool. I would love to see more places able to take advantage of this sort of solar and wind power when it makes sense for them. I, I, I think that's, that's fantastic. I don't think it's a panacea that's going to solve all the world's problems, but if this works, that's great. I love this. Yeah, Let's I do talk. too. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Who does it, right? Solar farms getting more powerful and getting smarter. I mean, 137 acres is is huge, but then again, we're talking outside of Reno. I mean, there's there's not a whole lot that's going to be put out there. It's the desert after all. As Duper says in the chat room, clouds brought to you by the sun. See? Yeah. See what he did there? Yeah. All right. Uh, let's talk about Nate Anderson's article in Ars Technica tomorrow, today. Uh, if you guys have seen it, he writes about his AT&T offer. Uh, I think Nate's in Chicago. That's where Ars Technica is headquartered. And he got an offer from AT&T Uverse, whom he had left to go to Comcast for his ISP, saying, hey, we've got fiber to the node in your neighborhood. It's going to be $19.95 a month at the one-year promotional price. Uh, so we'll need a one-year term commitment. Uh, there are up to $180 in early termination fees. We're also going to charge you $99 installation. And you're going to have to rent your modem for $6 a month unless you buy your own modem. Uh, and you'll get up to 768 kilobits per second. What do you think, huh? Tasty deal. Is this deal Nate from wrote, this year or is this deal from yes, like 10 years it's, ago? It's from today, from oh. this week. <laughs> Uh, and, and Nate said, okay, so I, I'm like, this is obviously an enticement offer because who wants 768? He went and looked up on the AT&T Uverse site. Top speed is 18 megabits per second for $56 a month. Now, what I love about this article is Nate said, this, this is an example of what's wrong with the ISP system in the United States, that this is even a marketable offer, that, that people wouldn't just laugh this away. Uh, maybe it's confusion over the 768. They see a big number and think it's 768 megabits per second by mistake. But Google Fiber... As an example, $70 a month, one gigabit per second, no construction fee. City of Seattle, $80 a month, one gigabit per second, one year contract required, but no install charge. And the city of Chattanooga, Tennessee, $70 a month, 100 megabits per second, some additional fees. Uh, but that is also an older network. That one's been around for a lot longer. So is the fact that we have these, these horrible offerings from big companies like AT&T who are supposedly like the backbone of our nation's uh, internet, uh, is that a product of government-supported duopolies? Or is AT&T just giving up on infrastructure and saying, you know what, we, we're, we're a mobile company now. We, we, we've got this, this industry, so we might as well milk as much money out of it as we can while it's still there. Ayaz, what do you think? Well, I think when it comes to AT&T and some, like a company like Verizon, they're not necessarily putting in money for infrastructure for landline-based communications. We saw Verizon had that Fios rollout that they stopped doing after a while after seeing that shareholders didn't seem to care that their customers were super happy with 20 megabits per second at a really low rate. It could be that 
it could be infrastructure costs as well. If you think about if there was one dumb pipe that you can keep switching, we wouldn't really have this problem, right? We have AT&T try to build out their network, Verizon try to do theirs, and Google did their own network, and they can offer these low prices because they're kind of doing it in this experimental model. AT&T is probably just doing this so they can get as much money as they can out of a what they consider an old business that probably won't be around for the longest time because their money is going towards mobile, mobile, mobile. Mobile. Yeah, when, when you've got these companies entrenched, they fight against anybody bringing in any competition. There have been several stories we've, we've had, especially down in the Carolinas, about municipalities who passed legislation or states that passed legislation preventing the government from making their own internet, saying, oh, no, no, this has to be private enterprise. And, th and this is what we're getting? This is the competition? This, that, that pre this is the best that an open market can present? It's because it's not an open market. What you've got are entrenched interests donating to the politicians, causing those politicians to then make the laws in some ways slightly favorable, in some ways incredibly favorable towards the incumbents who then have no kind of incentive to improve the network infrastructure. I mean, this is this is an example of 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 what is wrong. I think Nate Anderson is absolutely right uh, with the United States industry, and something needs to be done about it. And every time someone tries to say something needs to be done about it, they blame the government. Well, yeah, the government's wrong for giving the subsidies and giving the preferential treatment to these big companies. Not the government is wrong for trying to actually roll internet themselves in some cases. That may not be the right solution for everybody, but. You shouldn't prevent it from happening, and you shouldn't try to fight. They, they even tried to fight Google in Austin when they came in to, to say we're going to do Google Fiber in Austin. So, I think the whole promotional price thing is, is one of those things that um, a company like AT&T still to this day feels like can, it, can, it can skate by with stuff like that where we go, ooh, 1995 for a year? Cool. I won't, I won't cancel before a year, so I don't worry about that early termination fee. But when you really do the math, it's like, this is such a colossally bad deal. And the speeds aren't, I mean, the speeds are uh, insulting, right? Compared to what is possible in other places. So it's, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I guess it's its still just a, yeah, let's see how many people we can sell this to before we can't. <laughs> no, I think you're right. I think that, that is exactly what's going on. I think we're all agreed. Uh, this is the death throes of AT&T's infrastructure. But then they, they don't want anybody else to compete with them. It's, it's the worst of all possible worlds. Let's talk about something cheerier. Twitter with a, a new little feature that seems to be experimental. What's going on with this, IS? Yeah, F-Secure's Miko Hippinen noticed that Twitter is testing out a new feature in its cards. A list of sites that embedded that particular tweet appears at the bottom of some Twitter cards. So as an example, if you saw like a White House tweet, you'd see links and titles to CNN and ABC news articles where that tweet has been embedded. Now, the feature apparently came and went and returned over the course of a day. Twitter hasn't commented on the feature beyond pointing TechCrunch to a general blog post about Twitter testing hundreds of features all the time. I'm looking at these cards, and they're getting larger and larger. They have video players. They have Sometimes they have embedded photos. Sarah, at what point is the data too much in a Twitter card? If they add links to this, aren't we just building a web page in a web page? Well, what's wrong with that? I, I mean, it's not like you have to see all of that in line. That's something that you can choose to get more information about. Yeah, I mean, I see what you mean, that it's getting a little crowded in there. But, I mean, is there a certain type of information that we feel like Twitter just shouldn't be adding to its card data? I don't know. I'm okay with it. Does it does it automatically show up or do, is it a click to expand thing? That's what I couldn't figure it's out. I mean, the, isn't, isn't a Twitter card always click to expand, at least when you're looking at it on the web or in Twitter's official apps? I believe this is about embedded tweets, not necessarily the ones you see on the web. So if... No, it's... it's it's you, The way I understand it is when you're looking uh, on the Twitter website, it will say, hey, this post is embedded on these websites. And then when you go to that website, then you'd see it embedded. But it's it's on the Twitter feed where you see like, oh, I could, I could find more about this story at CNN or New York Times, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, the web, the expansion part? Yeah. I, I think you're right about the way you're, that's coming out. It's just kind of, now I'm getting a little wrapped up in the, the lingo. Sure. But as, so if I'm looking at Twitter and there's a little thing that says, you know, click to expand or embed, embed it on these websites and I click and I take the action to, to access the information, I'm not bothered by that at all. I think that's, I think that's excellent. 
I want to yeah. know, like, oh, okay, these people have, have covered this story. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, The Verge seems to think this is in line with Twitter's DVR mode that Dick Casola talked about, where you can get content with context. Do you think that's really what this is about? Is this closer and closer to getting, like, live events replayed? Because we can see, oh, this happened on CNN, this happened on ABC. This definitely fits in with the timeline aspect of things of like, oh, well, this broke, the story broke on ABC News and they embedded it so you can go back in time and see what they reported about it. I'm not sure if it would work in the in the DVR mode in watching something roll out if you're watching it later. That seems more entertainment related rather than breaking news related to me. Anyway, I, I really like the idea of figuring out tweets being related to a story, especially because, and Tech Meme actually does a pretty good job of this. Sometimes Tech Meme will, uh, for, for those of you who, who read Tech Meme regularly, you know, will attach a cluster of tweets underneath a popular story. So you get a little bit of context of like, oh, what are people talking about? But if I could figure out, you know, the, the, uh, the example of a White House tweet, there's a lot of context there, right? It's the White House's account. But if a tweet was sort of like, hey, what's this in reference to? I kind of don't get it. And I could quickly jump over to what that tweet references in a story that's, you know, relevant to my interests. I think that's a great idea. The other thing is I'm realizing that a long time ago we talked about Twitter and journalism. If, if that original tweet was incorrect, do you erase it or not? It seems like if you had these links at the bottom, you could have updates to that tweet. That, that might be the original source of controversy. But these links could give more context to explain, oh, that's what we yeah. thought and things have changed. And now we have this. Or, yeah, I mean, I, I see that playing out this way. Uh, some source, some primary source says X happened, uh, and then that's quoted, and then you see this is reported at these links, and then you go there and you say, well, X, X was mistaken when they said this because they thought, you know, and, 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 and you can expand on the story uh, so that, so that you, you get that context. I, I, I think that's a great point. I think that's a great idea. You know what else is great? The randomizer. <laughs> Especially because we have the William Shakespeare version of Star Wars coming out. It's a book by Ian Desher, a retelling of the movie presented as if William Shakespeare had written Star Wars, but they have a hilarious book trailer. Um, if you if you take a look here, yeah, there we go. Let's just click somewhere in the middle of it. Droids for which thou searchest. Alas, poor stormtrooper, I knew ye not, yet I obtained both uniform and life from thee. In time thy powers have weak become, old man. And yet thou canst not win, I'll warrant, Darth. For if thou strike me down, e'en now, e'en here, I shall more great and powerful become than e'er thou hast imagined possible. <laughs> so at the very least, silly. <laughs> in, in a way, it's not even that different. Well, it sounds like everybody's talking like Yoda. That's the first thing. Yes, right. And second, yeah. Darth Vader with a neck ruffle. Totally worth the trailer. And there's like, this is a very specialized audience. I know Jonathan Strickland's going to love this. He studies Shakespeare, Star Wars nerd. This was made for him if it wasn't made by him. I don't know. I, I think it's interesting that uh, the people who are willing to pick a username in the chat room seem to be slightly entertained by it, and the people who are anonymous uh, hate it. So that, I, that, I think that just is the internet at work. Let's uh, check. Is there anything on the calendar? It is quite a slow week because everybody's getting ready to do some patriotic stuff, at least in the U.S. But Apple is going to release its fiscal Q3 financial results on July 23rd. This is basically just, you know, quarterly stuff, but they've officially put it down. Uh, it will be scheduled to begin at 2 p.m. Pacific time and will be streamed through the company's investor relations page. All right. Let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. It's a message from Rich in lovely Cleveland. You know, he says it's lovely all the time. Tom it's always lovely. <laughs> always lovely in Cleveland. It's like it's always sunny in Philadelphia. It's always exactly. Lovely. They should put a solar farm there. Tom and Posse, while I don't see Apple putting out an iWatch this year, you have to admit the market for such a device is remarkable, uh, remarkably similar to just before the iPod and iPhone launched. Instead of Rio MP3 players or Palm Trios, we have Pebble, Sony, and a bevy of other smart fitness bracelets that are all providing limited functionality to a consumer base who have not been sold on the product category. Historically, this is when Apple strikes, putting out a refined product that defines how the category is perceived. Of course, one doesn't have to look further than the Apple TV to see that this doesn't always work. 
on a technical level. I think Apple could launch the iWatch. They've been pushing the Bluetooth low power standard since the 4S, but the big hang-up might be the market for it. While the iPhone sells exceedingly well, iPhone users are the only market for the device. Apple must not be convinced yet that an iWatch device would be something to encourage iPhone adaption necessary to push sales. Adoption, I think. Yeah, I, I think that's totally it. I think Rich Rich has probably nailed why that we haven't seen it yet. I guess the big question is, because he's right about the pattern and the way Apple has worked historically, do we think Apple can do it again? Uh, you know, it, I, I don't think when the iPad came out, anybody thought Apple was going to like revolutionize tablets and they totally did. So now it's sort of the other way, like, oh, Apple does it every time. Can they? Well, it's the iPhone and people laugh about the price. They're like, nobody's going to buy a phone for that much money because they originally didn't have a subsidized and that sold well, OK. And then they cut the price. So I don't know if, if Apple can do it this well, but they've had some flops, you know, the high Well, the five. iPhone was like the iPhone was the revolution, right? The iPad is like bigger uh, but people end up really liking the form factor. They get sold on it, but it's still, you know, it's still that iPhone idea. The watch, I think we're all just like, but you'd have to put less on the watch, not more. So where's the revolution there? And maybe, yeah, maybe it's something that we have to see to believe. But I think that's the problem that everyone seems to have is like, but what, how is it? How, how can it be like a huge, huge, hey, let's let's change the game again with a smaller yeah. device? Apple fandom is collectively holding their breath right now. Yeah, waiting that's a good to way see to put it. If they can do it again. Uh, and everybody else is just enjoying the reprieve from the constant onslaught of announcements, I think. Well, that is it for this episode of Tech News Today. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. You can uh, join us all the time on our website. In fact, in our in our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com, you can join in picking the stories. It's one of the sources we use when we decide what we're going to put in the show each day. Uh, it's one of the reasons that's where I found the Nate Anderson story about AT&T that we looked at today was in the subreddit. So go there, technewstoday.reddit.com. What really helps us is when you vote on the stories. Of course, we need them submitted as well. You can find us on the web all the time, twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us, TNT at twit.tv. And give us a call, leave us a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. We'll be back tomorrow with Natalie Morris. See you then.